Good morning. Can everybody hear me? Right. Thank you for attending conference paper session number 22, Predictive Energy and Comfort Simulation Methods. Um, today I'm going to present to you my first part on my master's thesis, which is called Revealing Occupancy Patterns in Office Buildings Through the Use of Annual Occupancy Sensor Data. And here are the learning ob objectives for this today's session. And my, the first two are for my particular presentation, which is uh, identify why better assumptions in ener to energy building models are necessary to improve energy simulations. And the second one is to expose you to additional reference material and uh, occupancy diversity factors. I would like to acknowledge Kevin Van Den, Y. Mellenberg, and Craig Rieger, which are co-authors for uh, today's research. And the work was supported by the U.S. Energy, uh, the U.S. Department of Energy. And I also like to thank my Major Professor Ralph Baldwig, um, IDL members Eri Genady and Brad Aker, and Professor Milos for their guidance, and Christian Sin Corporation, Guy Newsham, and Asylum Technology for their support in their in the data procurement. So, an agenda for today is uh, I will give you a brief overview of energy simulation parameters, um, especially in occupancy diversity factors, and the references that are found in ASHRAE 90.1, and some of the the uh, a brief um, description of the building and sensor data, and finish with uh, graphical results of the analysis and with a conclusion. So as you all know, um, there's a lot of parameters that are involved in defining an uh, energy, energy model. And some of them include physical parameters like building size, orientation, construction materials, HVAC size, and they all usually represented by one number, which is usually the design number of that specific equipment. And they're usually also uh, easy to find from architectural engineering plans. But others are time-dependent variables. And they are require more in-depth measurements, trend logging through energy loggers. Um, and they are uh, mostly dependent on occupants and weather conditions and are represented by just a design number. They also need a, a schedule or um, like it, a uh, diversity factor. And accurate information and assumptions are important in a uh, building simulation because in the first place, uh, building stakeholders want to, in the first, uh, they build the model to uh, improve energy performance in their buildings or uh, the thermal comforts for their occupants or comfort in general for their occupants. And they also need to know how effective the energy conservation measures that they are um, analyzing are going to be, and usually they are done by an, um, building a calibrated energy model of the building. And if you ever build a calibrated model, model it's time intensive and um, a really uh, uh, laborious process. And diversity factors, also known as schedules, are hourly fractions from zero to one for the whole 24 hour period and are used to account for. Um, the energy simulation uh, to account for the variation in the energy simulation that comes um, with weather conditions or uh, occupants and tenants in the building and also occupancy is one of the diversity factors that uh, that uh, di uh, diversity factors are used to account for the partial attendance of occupants in the building but this study will focus on uh, specifically on occupancy diversity factors, and that is because there is uh, limited research on this type of occupancy patterns, especially for the commercial office building. And occupancy can have large impact in energy calculations uh, in, in simulation because um, uh, occupancy in buildings is directly correlated to the ventilation that um, is required to bring outside air from or into the building. So uh, the building is a lead patent certified building in Boise, Idaho, 195 square feet, 11 stories, and their tenants include a variety of uh, businesses in law, policy, financial, uh, utility, software. So it's not just based on occupancy for one industry. It's uh, a whole variety of uh, firms. And the uh, sensors themselves uh, uh, are operate on a passive infrared, infrared technology and they control the lightings in that particular building so there are no switches in that building so as soon as the occupant comes into the building uh, the lighting will come on and after a certain time delay that the occupants leave that particular space 
uh, the, light, the lights will shut off. Um, usually it's 10 minutes. And there's a total of six, 629 sensors in that building. And here's a breakdown of those uh, sensors with the private office having the most, uh, which is 35% of the sensors, and open office plants having 12% uh, of the sensors. And the images below are floor plates for that particular building. One of them is, the one in green is where the majority is private offices, and the one in purple is where the uh, open offices, or the majority of the floor plan is open offices. And the total floor plan in private office for this particular building is 21% for private offices and 27% is open plan offices and the rest is just uh, uh, the other uh, rooms listed here on this table. So the data is a 23 month data set, a total of 153,980 sensor days for private offices. And since it was a change of value for the sensors, um, each minute was given an occupied or an unoccupied state and, but so, and since um, the sensors also malfunctioned in some of the days um, where it was registering occupants in private offices for more than two days or two days or more. And so we decided to uh, filter that and remove um, that data from the analysis. So if the sensor registered an occupant in that particular space for more than 48 hours, we took out the data and the opposite fault can be true where the occupancy or the sensor will not register a occupant for more than two days, but that is still plausible because people can be gone from their offices for more than two days. Uh, for example, business trips or um, them being sick, among other things. So this is the current research or current occupancy reference found in ASHRAE 90.1. Uh, there are several characteristics. Um, the time start of the occupant, uh, when they leave the office, um, a maximum peak, and when they uh, go to their break for lunch or whatever they decide to do. And, but the measured data, as you can see, is, uh, does not reach levels of 95% as presented in the ASHRAE references. The max is about 55% uh, of occupants there. And then we broke up the, the occupancy by month. So, and, and these graphs, it's too much for the energy simulation to just input that data into their simulation model. So we decided to do a t-test. Oh, by the way, October has the highest occupancy with August having the lowest. So we decided to do three clusters, one high, medium, and low level clusters. And the high level cluster includes January, March, April, June, September, and October. And the low levels include November and August. And we thought that this sounds pretty reasonable since November is a holiday month of Thanksgiving and all the, those vacations. In August, pr probably uh, most of the occupants are trying to do their last minute vacationing. So. And so we did similarly with uh, a weekday type. Um, Monday have, uh, it's known for having a bad reputation for being the start of the month, but people still go to work on Mondays and they are eager to leave the office on Friday. So it's with that dip 30 minute earlier, um, dip on the second peak there. And then Tuesday and Wednesday, Thursdays did not have a uh, discernible difference. So I presented occupancy on an average scale, um, but in reality, occupancy is random. People do not show up at, um, do not show up at work at the same time or leave at the same time and they come in at different levels. So like at some of the presentations I heard earlier, it's probably best to present a range of inputs and get a range of outputs and um, instead of just one number. And also this res uh, pre um, current research can help the development of stochastic models because um, they're trying to model the, the stochasticity of, of occupancy and so, and they've been having problems with with modeling um, long absence days, like in the case of business trips and, and illness in their energy models. So now um, looking at the holidays, holidays are not created equal. Some of the, some of the holidays are observed by some of the occupants and some of others are done. For example, um, Columbus Day and Martha Luther King Day 
uh, King Day is have high occupancies where that dotted red line is is uh, a day without uh, holidays and um, low levels. Some are pretty universal among the occupants are uh, of Independence Day, Thanksgiving, Christmas, New Year's. And I, I thought it would be interesting to see what happens before and after the holidays. So again, uh, before the holidays, people are eager to be out of their office and get an early start on their holiday. And um, after the holiday, they definitely don't want to come back as there's a, still higher um, than the average of all the holidays. And just a summary of all the different space types, um, we can see some, com com some of the commonalities. Um, for example, all the uh, shared spaces, um, for example, bathroom, break rooms, open offices have high occupancies, and then uh, private offices are more in the middle, and with support rooms or electrical rooms having um, just the maintenance crew go in. And this is just comparing the ASHRAE standards to open and private offices. Um, there's a significant reduction in the private office, 46%, and then there's a 20, a 12, or 14% reduction in the peak for, when looking at open offices. And um, the second part of my thesis was actually putting putting the the diversity factors into energy simulation, and I just present to you one of the results. Uh, it's a large office reference building created by PNNL. Um, the 498,000 square feet building, and as you can see, uh, the the solid lines are electricity, and the dollar lines is energy consumption, with the x-axis being the months. So, in open plan offices, there was a reduction in electricity by 20 percent, uh, and an increase in gas consumption by 98 percent. And these percentages is the coefficient of variance for the root mean square. And we found, and that's what the 148 is supposed to be a positive um, for the um, the electricity. There was a, a reduction of 43 percent and uh, an increase of gas consumption on 148 uh, percent. And I would like to mention that this is like the idealized version of an occupant um, we're trying to simulate here. That is. When, as soon as the occupant leaves his office space, it's assumed in this simulation that uh, the occupants will turn off all their equipment and all their lights when in reality that would not be the case. They might leave the, their computer on or some of the lights, especially if it's a short amount of period. But in this simulation, we tried to do uh, an idealized version to see much how, occupants, how much occupants can affect their, um, the energy consumption in the building. So conclusion, um, the data suggests that there's two level, different, different levels of occupancy, um, three for months, three clusters for months, three clusters for Monday over the weekdays, and uh, three clusters for the holiday groups. And the measured data shows that there's like 46 a reduction in private offices, 14 with, for the open plan, and they can have a, uh, a significant impact in the energy calculations resulting in energy models. And can, and can be more difficult to calibrate. So with this uh, diversity factors, I hope that I can eliminate one of those uncertainty, un uncertainties in the building model and you can focus on something else in the um, energy simulation to calibrate the building. Questions? My name's Christopher Wills. I'm with CenturyLink. Um, question for you on the building. Was it fully occupied, all the spaces, leased, it, or? It was 95 percent, um, 95 percent of the space was uh, leased, so it was pretty, uh, almost fully occupied. One company or many companies? What's that? One company or many companies? Uh, many companies. It's not just uh, uh, one. It's uh, different firms. Thank you. Um, Carl Shapiro with Steve Winter Associates. I have two questions. The first one is, how do you know how 90.2 got their assumptions for occupancy? Uh, I wish I did. I tried to research that uh, from the very beginning, see where they, um, the occupancy factors came from, but I never found anything. Okay, uh, that'd be interesting. And then my second question was, how do those sensors communicate? How do you 
take data logs from them, and how expensive are they to implement? Um, where there's a uh, lighting company that was involved with the data procurement, it was just uh, saved in a database. And so it re there's two separate logs for that uh, occupancy sensors. One is for uh, when the, actual, the lights actually turn, turn on and turn off. And the other one is when, actu when the occupancy sensor detects activity within the 24 feet diameter zone. So I took that from the instantaneous um, data and did all my analysis on that. And are they are they stored in the sensor? Do you, can you no? They're stored them? on a server somewhere else in so the building. So they communicate with the server. Somehow. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Yep.